All right, let's get started here before I run out of time. Let me say this for the folks in the online audience as well. Uh, we're still giving away our two free booklets to anyone in the online audience who asks. You just have to send us your uh, snail mail address. The first booklet is called Jesus Wasn't Talking to You. And the second booklet is the one that Mike wrote called Things I've Been Taught in the Bible That Are Not True, his story of conversion. And uh, we've come to refer to these as the yellow one and the green one. So if you want a yellow one or a green one, or some people ask for both, we can mail those out to you. <clears throat> Sorry, um, you're at part 37 in a series, so you're only three dozen lessons behind. So <laughs> catch up. All right, so let's get started here. If you want to get ahead of me, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse We're asking the question here, or answering the question at the top of page 26. That's what we started on last time. The question is, how did we get here? How did we get into this mess of not understanding our Bible timeline, not understanding that Christ made an unscheduled, unprophesied visit to earth to save his chiefest enemy, Saul of Tarsus, and gave him a dispensation, gave him grace doctrine to teach. How do we get in this mess where nobody knows that information anymore? And let's see here. We've got, what do we have? We've only got two more, three more pages in this booklet. So we should be done with this series and probably 17 or 18 more lessons <laughs> at the rate I'm going. But last time we saw how the events leading up to and the Council of Nicaea back in the fourth century and Emperor Constantine and what he did and how they essentially codified and put into law an anti-Pauline doctrine as this is the doctrine of Christianity. And we ended on this happy little note in the booklet. This is about the middle of page 26 and I quote, when the Emperor Constantine declared himself to be the Sumus Pontifex, what followed was more than 10 centuries of dark ages, during which time people who professed Christ rather than Mary or the popes, people who denied transubstantiation, were fed to lions and burned at the stake. That's what happened after this was put in. So let's move this along in our timeline. Here's Constantine. That was around 325. And you've all heard about this in history class. What follows after is what's called the Dark Ages. We don't want to live in the Dark Ages. But when we see that this system was put in place whereby you stand up and say, I, I believe in salvation by grace through faith alone, by trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ alone plus nothing. That got you killed. That got you burned at the stake. That got you fed to lions. And this really explains these verses in a much clearer way. When you see what happened in history here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And in this case, for a thousand years, you're suffering persecution by people who call themselves Christians. 
good Christian people burning you at the stake for believing God's word over their doctrine. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But quit now and get out. Save your, that's not what he says, is it? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Who did Timmy learn from? Paul. He learned from the Apostle Paul. The revelation that the risen Lord Jesus Christ gave to him and said, get this information out. So this week, as we move along here, I want you, I want you to imagine where we're living in a world where just about everyone in this building is a criminal. Everyone in this building is a criminal and you've committed a crime that's not only worthy of death in this life, but hell in the next life. Just about every one of you I see is guilty. Guilty as charged. What is your crime? You have a copy of a Bible that you can read in your own language. You are guilty of death in this life and damnation in the next. Anybody want to live in that world? Did you know that it used to be a crime like that for a regular person to have a copy of a Bible? What evil, atheist, secular power put that into place? The Roman Catholic Church. Colossians 3.16 is a crime. Think about that. Let the word, we just read it, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. How are you going to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly if you can't read it and it's illegal for you to have a copy of it? Did anybody know that? It used to be a crime for normal people to have a Bible. The Council of Toulouse, that's a Frenchy French word. The Council of Toulouse, they were towards the end of the Dark Ages, 1229. They declared, we prohibit that any layman, that's you and me, normal people, any layman possess the books of the Old or New Testament translated into the common language. Now, at this period in history, you've got to understand now, coming through the Dark Ages, the majority of people were illiterate. Couldn't read or write. So they would have to go to the church and the priests and the cardinals and all the other people, they would teach them and spoon fed them the doctrines that they wanted them to know. And that's where the rise of stained glass windows, you ever wonder why we have stained glass windows in churches? They would put pictures of these people and these stories in the Bible into these windows and that's how they would teach the illiterate masses about what they wanted them to know about God and His Word and Heaven and all that. But the Bible was kept away from the people. The only people that could read it were the powerful, educated, learned men chosen by the Roman Catholic Church. And it was only in Latin. The other people didn't speak Latin. And if you, like I said, if you stood up and said, but sir, I just read the just shall live by faith. Sir, I read that the gospel is Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures was dead and buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and I'm told to just trust that as full and complete payment for my sins, Ephesians 1.13 and I'll be sealed to the day of redemption. Really? Do you really mean that, sir? Yeah, I read it. You die. You are a heretic. You have spoken against the Pope and the Holy Roman Catholic Church. You will be delivered to die. Oh, and we're going to burn down your house, and those books you wrote, we're going to burn those too. 
That's the situation that people in the Christian world had to live with for a very long time. Now this council, I want you, I, I'm not going to read all of this obviously because they tend to be very wordy. But they released out of this council 49 canons. But I want to give you a little taste of it so you can see how much power the church, the Roman church, had over people and their lives and their well being. This is, now I got this from the Pope's website. This is in their, their history. Let me quote On heretics, we excommunicate and anathematize every heresy raising itself up against this holy, orthodox, and Catholic faith. You can't get much worse than that. Excommunicated and anathematized? That's, you're out, you die, oh, and we curse you to hell, too. We condemn all heretics, whatever names they may go under. Let those condemned be handed over to the secular authorities present or to their bailiffs for due punishment. The goods of the condemned are to be confiscated. You believe salvation by grace through faith? Okay, we'll send him to be executed. Go to his house, take all of his stuff. Anything that's of value is ours now. Listen to this. Those who are only found suspect of heresy, suspicion, those who are only found suspect of heresy are to be struck with the sword of anathema unless they prove their innocence. Can I re restate that in another term? Guilty until proven innocent if somebody suspects you. And this is in their code. Orders that the house in which any heretic shall be discovered be destroyed. Burn your house down. Listen to this one. Every man above 14 years of age and every woman above 12 to abjure heresy, heresy to make open profession of the Romish faith and to swear to hunt out the heretics to be repeated every two years. Recusants to be looked on as heretics. So if you say, I, I really don't want to be your spy. I really don't want to go hunt down my family and friends and try to see if they're heretics or not. If you choose not to make that oath, you're a heretic. Forbids the laity to have in their possession any copy of the books of the Old and New Testament. And you have to go to church. Forbidden to be absent from oneself on church on Sunday. So forced or participation. So we have here property confiscation, loyalty oaths. What else is on that list? executions, excommunications, to hell. What else is in there? Guilty till proven innocent. Till proven innocent. Oh, there's book burning in there. I didn't read the stuff on there. Compulsory attendance. Forced spying for thought crimes. What else do we have on that list? Well, there's imprisonments in there too. Anybody want to hop in a time machine and go back and see what life was like back then? I mean, this is, has anybody read the book 1984? Yeah. Is this not 1984? I mean, the only thing that's missing is the three minutes of hate every day. 
But this is like Orwellian stuff put in place by the Catholic Church. And you wonder why I can't go back in history and find more people and their writings of people that believe like me. Because they were killed and their books were burnt. That's why. And that's just, that's one of the scores of councils that you can go back and read. Now, doesn't that help us put things into perspective when we're complaining about 117 days of coronavirus? I'd rather be in 2020 any day of the week than back there. I don't want to wear a mask. I don't want to have my house burned down and be killed and all my stuff taken away by the church just for believing in salvation by grace. How's that? <laughs> These people had it a teeny, teeny bit worse than we ever have. But, you know, as we're in 2 Timothy, if you read on there in chapter 3, if you look at verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. How are you going to know it as a child if you're banned from having a copy of it? You can't read it. You don't have access to it. So clearly, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, wants us to have copies of these Scriptures and to study them to show ourselves approved unto God. How are we going to do it if we're not allowed to see it? That should tell anyone, was that a right thing, what the Roman church did back then? Study to show yourself approved. How are you going to do that? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You live in a world where that is a crime. You live in a situation where to obey God, you have to disobey your government. What do you do? What do you do when living godly in Christ Jesus, following the instructions that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to you, are crimes? That's a rock and a hard place, isn't it? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable for different things. I would say we should learn a lesson from an event that happened before our dispensation began and from the Apostle Peter. Look over at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 and verse 27. Now Peter, he goes from sad, in the dumps, like we thought Jesus was the Messiah, but now he's dead, to now when he comes back to life, Peter is, doesn't care anymore. He's going to get in trouble with whoever and say whatever the Holy Spirit puts in his mouth. And he's already gotten in trouble with the rulers. And in verse 27, he says, When they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked him, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? Didn't I give you an order? I'm your government. Didn't I ban you from preaching this? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, What? You've been outranked, high priest. We ought to obey God rather than men. And then he starts writing and preaching on them again. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. So didn't I tell you never to say that name? The first thing out of his face is, Jesus is alive. I'm going to obey God rather than men. This is when you have to understand the command structure and authority. And I know somebody's thinking right now, Romans 13, Romans 13. 
God ordained the powers. Yes, we'll get to that. God instituted human government. And we know that Romans 13 says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So a lot of people use this verse that we should obey the government no matter what. Well, I'm sorry, if you make preaching the gospel, if you make teaching salvation by grace through faith a crime, if you make having a copy of God's word and studying to show yourself approved unto God a crime, I'm guilty. Amen. I'm not going to change. We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, it's true Romans 13 teaches us what our response to government should be in a normal setting. Normal setting, they're there to keep order, punish evildoers, keep society moving smoothly. That's normal, isn't it? Normal governments do that. Normally, we don't have a guy on the scene like Hitler exterminating millions of people just because of who they are. Normally, unless you're in North Korea, we don't live under a communist dictatorship that runs every aspect of your life. That's normal. Romans 13 does not teach that if you're under Catholic rule in the Dark Ages that you have to obey them and believe what they say, does it? Deny Bible to line yourself up with Rome. Romans 13 does not teach that. When you have a governmental institution like this council that codifies laws and rules that are a terror to good works, your duty is to follow God, obey God rather than men. Amen. They codify an institution that's a terror to salvation by grace through faith according to the gospel Christ gave to Paul. When they codify that, you ought to obey God rather than men. Many people did this to one degree or another. You can read about them in Fox's Book of Martyrs from one place. Many of them were beaten, tortured, burned to death, tongues cut out, forced to watch their family members executed right before they got executed themselves. You know, a great day for anybody. Just for saying, no, I'm going to go with the book. I'm going to go with what God said. Here's one such story. A guy named Malden, or near Malden, a town named Malden, a guy named John Clark put up a post on his church door that said the Pope was anti-Christ. Kind of like Martin Luther, he used to write, when he'd write to the Pope, he called him your hellishness rather than your holiness. Your hellishness. <laughs> He called the Pope Antichrist. For this offense, he was repeatedly whipped and then branded on the forehead. Going afterwards, so he got his warning, whipped, branded on the forehead. Then he went later and he started demolishing some idols. Catholic idols, you know, their relics and their shrines. He started demolishing those. For that, they chopped off his right hand and his nose. Mm -hmm. They tore his arms and breasts open with pincers. And the writer of the book says, he sustained these cruelties with amazing fortitude and was even sufficiently cool to sing the 115th Psalm, which expressly forbids idolatry. What do they do next? They threw him in the fire and burnt him to ashes. One little thing. The Pope is against Christ. You shouldn't have all these idols around. You die. We right dividers. We love 2 Timothy 3.16, don't we? All scripture is given by inspiration. Do we love it enough to risk our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor for it? 
If it ever came down to it, would we be the one willing to, I'm going to stand with the Bible, kill me? I'm not with you? Should we fight that much to have copies of God's Word around? Should we resist that? Oh, I've hit enough in my heart, I'll be fine. Even if you look under the law, what did the law of Moses teach Israel about God's words? They were writing it on the, the frontlets, and they are writing it on their doorposts, and there are God's Word everywhere. Talk about it from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. We were supposed to have copies of God's Word in a language that you could read. Let me quote the booklet again here. Towards the bottom of page 26, the Bible was said to exist only in the Latin text. Meaning it was not possible that you could have a Bible in the vulgar tongue. You've heard that? There's the gentry and the vulgars. High society and the laity. But they said it's not possible to have a Bible in the vulgar tongue. Isn't that peculiar? What are we here today? There's no Bible except the one that exists in the originals. In the original Greek, in the original Hebrew. And who tells us that? The learned, degreed people who live in their ivory towers of academe. Well, anybody that says they went back to the original is either ignorant or lying to you because there are no originals. There are zero copies that said, written by Pete according to the Holy Spirit. This date, there's no originals. All we have is copies and translations. But the wizards of smart in the ivory towers will come to the Bible and you just want to read your Bible and believe it and study it and they say, oh, what an unfortunate rendering that was. If you look at the original Greek, what you should find is the Greek actually says, if you study, if you look at the original Hebrew, They're saying God can't preserve his words? But it's, you see how history just repeats itself over and over again. Towards the end of the Dark Ages, and we're moving along here, this guy was in the 16th century. You see another guy appear who says, I think we ought to obey God rather than men. His name is William Tyndale. Anybody ever heard that name? Let me read a quote from him. He says, Let it not make thee despair, neither yet discourage thee, O reader. Don't be in despair, don't be discouraged. Why? that it is forbidden thee in the pain of life and goods, or it is made breaking of the king's peace, or treason unto his highness. Don't be despaired that you're committing treason against the king by reading this. It's a short way to say that. What's the crime? To read the word of thy soul's health. To read a copy of the Bible. For if God be on our side, what matter maketh it who be against us, be they bishops or cardinals or popes? Don't be despaired you're committing treason. You're choosing to obey God rather than men, is what he said. Now where would William Tyndale get a crazy idea like that? Yeah, definitely in the Bible, but specifically, he got it by reading Paul. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 31, he says, What shall we say to those things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 
Don't be despaired that you're committing treason against the king by reading this. You're on God's side. More specifically, God's on your side. Here's another quote from Tyndale. It is impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the scripture were plainly laid before their eyes in their mother tongue. Heretic, treason, worthy of death, opposing the Catholic Church. He just came right out and said it. It's impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the scripture were plainly laid before their eyes in their mother tongue. Where would somebody get a crazy idea like that? Reading Paul. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He's choosing God's side at the risk of his own neck. Here's another quote from Tyndale. I defy the Pope and all his laws. That's like painting yourself bright orange and saying, hey, Rome, come kill me. I'm right over here. I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere these many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than thou doest. Whoa. Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to get a copy of the Bible into the hand of every plow boy. Come kill me, I'm right over here. So, as we know, Tyndale did a godly thing to help others. Oh, that's charity. And his earthly reward was uh, many mansions, millions of dollars, and the first Gulfstream jet. Well, if you're, if you're being godly, you get blessed, right? No. He didn't get the first Gulfstream jet. In early 1536, he was condemned as a heretic, degraded from the priesthood, and delivered to secular authorities for punishment. Friday, October 6, 1536, Tyndale was brought to the cross in the middle of the town square, and they said, we now give you the opportunity to recant. Recant your heresy. Come back to Mother Rome. Uh, he refused, and he was given a moment to pray before they killed him. What do you think you would pray? You've read a little bit of Paul. You've understood that people should have a copy of God's Word. You've put your talents and efforts into translating God's Word into a language that people can understand. And here you are, you've lost everything, and they're about to kill you. What do you think your prayer would be? Help me, Lord! Why is this happening? Tyndale prayed, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. His prayer was for other people. He did this while he was standing on top of a pile of firewood, chained to a post, getting ready to be burned to death. And his prayer was, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. We'd like to all think that would be our prayer too, don't we? You never know till the rubber hits the road. For his godly efforts, he was then burned at the stake. But by then, uh, they had put in place a system. What happened was when they burned people at the stake, the people watching the person get executed will actually start having sympathy for the people being killed and you know, would kind of be against the ruling powers. Well, they couldn't have that. So what they did was they secretly strangled the person at the stake right before they burned them so they wouldn't scream. So that's what happened to Tyndale. Right before you're getting your reward of an unjust execution for the simple thing of trying to get the scriptures into people's hands. His thought was to pray for other people. Specifically, the king who was killing him. I'm praying for the person who's now killing me. Where would Tyndale 
get a crazy idea like that. He read Paul. Look over at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. First Timothy chapter two, verse one. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, except for kings that kill you. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Why? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's too late for Tyndale. He's tied up to the post. He's standing on the firewood. That prayer was not going to help him one iota, was it? He's a dead man. Why in the world would he pray, Lord, open the king of England's eyes? Because he knew what God's will was. He knew God's will is for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the best way to effect change and to have more of that happen is for people to be able to have copies of the scriptures that they could read themselves. Therefore, I'm going to pray for this king who's killing me. Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Amen. He learned, Tyndale learned, and I understand these reformers and these people that started what came to be called the Protestant Reformation, they had a lot of problems. But they had recovered enough Pauline doctrine to where they learned the just shall live by faith. His time was over. He was in the last seconds of his life on this earth, and his thought was charity. What's charity? Love doing something to benefit someone else. He prays for the king of England that the Lord would open his eyes. Do you know the king that he prayed for? Henry VIII. That king later converted to Protestantism. That king later made it legal for anyone to own a copy of the Tyndale Bible. A king who later regarded Tyndale, the man whom he'd killed, as a hero. Charity. We'll close with this. Remember charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Tyndale spoke like seven different languages, translated all kinds of stuff. And though I have a gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. I would suggest that, you know, obviously I wasn't in his mind, I didn't know Tyndale, but I would suggest he had a, quite a bit of Pauline doctrine moving around in his head for his last act on this planet to be thinking in a charitable way about others and to pray for his executioner. And that is all I have for this week. I was going to try to add more, but I'm glad I didn't now because I'm out of time. But that is how we got here. That is how we got to the point where 
No one on the planet knows the simple information that Christ was sent not but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made to the fathers. He revealed a mystery later to the apostle Paul, ushered in a new dispensation and a new gospel. That's how we got to the point where nobody knows that. It was ignored and forgotten about moving up to here and it was codified into law that no one should know this information for century after century after century and then when the reformers come in I'm not going to spend a terrible amount of time on the reformers but you'll see that yes they got quite a few things right but it's been said before and it's a great illustration the Protestant nut didn't fall very far from the Catholic tree there's a lot of things in Protestantism that I call them diet Catholic. <laughs> not full Catholic, not full flavor, they're diet Catholic. But I, I don't call myself a Protestant. Because the Protestants, they were part of the Roman Church. They were protesting what they saw as wrong and trying to reform. I've never been a part of that church. I'm a member of the church, the body of Christ, because God saved my miserable soul based on my faith in his finished work. Amen. So I've never been a part of that to protest. I'm outside of it. That's all I have for this week. Does anyone have any thoughts or comments?